I, I was going to begin by how nervous I am in, in front of you because I am probably the least cyber-oriented, knowledgeable person in this room. But um, in preparation for the talk, I, I began to do a lot of research in, in this area, and I got to speak to people in the military, I got to speak to people who worked in the NSA, um, and, and the more I learned, I, I kind of came to this conclusion, I, I call it an assumpt, I'll explain that in a few minutes, but that um, when it comes to understanding this world of cybersecurity, uh, we're all novice. We're all novice. And the purpose of this convention or this, this uh, conference today is to really get you to think differently, is to kind of put you out there and to see what is happening today that is going to affect you tomorrow. And through this is you're going to make some decisions. You're going to make some very, very key decisions that you're making actually right now that are going to affect what happens the next day, the next day, five years, ten days, uh, ten years down the road. Now, let me explain a little what's going to happen, because I've worked enough with very, very bright people, very talented people, uh, very senior people. And in these kind of conferences, this is some of the typical scenarios. First of all, there's some ideas that are very, very interesting, very, very exciting, and you're starting to process them right now. And you're going to get back to your office tomorrow, and you're going to get inundated with your regular work, and the aura of that idea is going to start to diminish. And then, all of a sudden, you're going to start doing some thinking, and you're going to make some assumptions. And those assumptions are going to kind of sabotage you moving forward on the idea. Or maybe you come back, and you're really excited about a new idea. You believe in some information that was conveyed today. You, it, it just channeled some energy and some thinking in a direction that, wow, this is what I've been looking for. And you go back to the office, and you start talking to some of your, your employees, or you start talking to some of your peers, and all of a sudden, you get pushback from them. Because what are they doing? They're making assumptions as you start to talk. And now it's act as barriers to keeping from where you want to go. Let me ask a question. How many of you have made an assumption in the past hour? Raise your hand if you made an assumption in the past hour. Oh, okay. Admirable. Terrific. Usually when I talk in conferences, I get about four people that raise their hand. About four people that raise their hand. So this is great. So, making an assumption has nothing to do with your intelligence, your knowledge, or your experience. I, I don't mean to take away any of that from any of you because you're all really bright people here, and you're very knowledgeable, and you're very experienced in this field. But, but let, me, let me just show you examples. Um, anyone know this gentleman, Aaron Ralston? Now, he's uh, famous because he was a hiker. He caught his arm between two rocks, and he realized he, will never, he couldn't get it out, so what did he do? He had to cut his own arm off. And what was one of his biggest concerns on the way to the hospital? One of his biggest fears? He didn't want to get a shot because he's afraid of needles. He's afraid of needles. This gentleman, Orville Wright, he was one of the two brothers that ushered in the age of aviation. Now, of course, the Brazilians might disagree with that. I don't know if you saw it on the Olympics. Oh, sorry. Sorry, or overwrite. Um, so, you know, he and his bro brother ushered in the Asian, and, they, and they, they, they built and they flew. I mean, this man was absolutely brilliant. And when it was suggested to him that, you know what, Orville, why don't we smooth out, kind of smooth out the runway? You know, we'll, we'll, we'll cover the debris. You know, we'll cover the rocks. We'll cover the cow dung. We'll get, we'll get rid of that stuff. He said, if man had to pave the fly strip, he doesn't deserve to fly. All the right, the inventor of aviation dismissed the idea of the tarmac. Harry Houdini, the greatest escape artist in the world, Nothing could hold him back. So one day, he's riding with his friend in a car. It was his friend, his wife was, uh, Harry was here, and his wife was over by the, the passenger door. And um, it's a new model car. Now, Harry Houdini, he, he was fairly successful, and he had his own cars, but this was a new model car. 
and they're riding, and they pull up to the sidewalk, and the driver gets out, and he walks out, and he starts walking away. And he turns around, where's Harry? Where's my wife? And he goes back to the car, and there is Harry Houdini stuck in the car. Harry Houdini couldn't figure out the configuration of the door handle. And even he said, you know, here I am, Harry Houdini, I can get out of any container, any weight, any size, anywhere in the world, but how do I get out of this damned car? One slight change in design stymied the master. Three talented, inquisitive people with guts to cut their arm. These are people that we admire and we respect. And yet at the same time, they make assumptions which act as barriers to their own success. And what I'd like to do today is to kind of help you identify the fact of when you're making those assumptions, how to identify that you're making them, and then a little process on how to deal with it. So three people. They can think differently, but something happens that stops them from thinking differently. What is that? It's when they have to move out of their comfort zone. See, we all have our comfort zones. It's something, you know, we're, we're, we're in right now. Now, in the world of cybersecurity, there is, there is no security in, in the concept of it is always changing. There is always a threat. Something is solved, and all of a sudden, you know, a new code is made, a new code is broken. A new solution is found, and then somebody finds a way to break that solution or change that solution. It is ongoing. You, it's a world in which it just, it's 24-7. It doesn't stop. It doesn't rest. Which means, as individuals, as human beings, we are constantly being pushed out of our comfort zone. And we're out of our comfort zone, it generates a bunch of different feelings. So, for example, we're dealing with the unknown. Uh, we move out of our comfort zone, we might be dealing with fear. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to try this. This is different. What if it doesn't succeed? All of those things, as that, that's what we experience out of the comfort zone, we have a tendency to want to come back to our comfort zone. There's an anxiety that's created by these unknowns, by these fears. And what is it that we use to push ourselves back? We use our assumptions. Our assumptions. Now, this is a, a mind map created by Chris Argyris. He's a, he passed away, but he's a, one of the most famous management gurus at, um, at Harvard. And what he did is he decided, let's, let's, let's map out how we think, because thinking is invisible. So you start with selecting, oh, you have a pool of data, you select from that data, and you move up the ladder. In the middle of that ladder is the assumption. And the reason I show this is that I really want to emphasize the point that the assumption is a key component to every decision that we make. And so, if you judge yourself for making an assumption, and I know in the Army there's a, there's a, there's a discipline for recognizing and dealing with assumptions, but even in that aspect, even when I've talked to people in the Army, there's a bunch of personal assumptions that we make along the way that drive this, that end up affecting, ultimately, the top of the ladder, the decision, and the action that we take. I believe we should, or I don't use the word, should, I believe that assumptions are neither good nor bad. We don't judge ourselves for making them. It's what we do with them that makes the difference. And by the way, it's a universal, it's a universal. I travel around the globe, and I've dealt with all different countries and all different cultures, and the assumption pops up everywhere. It is a universal aspect. We all, it's just part of our behavior. It's part of our DNA. Now, um, I created this database, or my company created this database called DAD. And the reason we call it DAD is that, um, well, first of all, you know the expression to assume is to make an ass out of you and me? You've heard that, right? Well, there's another one, which is the assumption is the mother of all, I'll say it politely, screw-ups. The assumption is the mother of all screw-ups. So we decided to create something called DAD, which is a dangerous assumption database. Because the first part is to recognize, yes, you know what, I make assumptions, nothing wrong with that, I'm going to make assumptions hundreds of times a day. Today you've made thousands of assumptions in listening to what people are saying. 
And you, I want you to be aware that some of those assumptions may actually be barriers to actually changing. Some of them could be very productive in moving you forward. We're going to talk about that. Most assumptions that we make are actually subconscious. And you don't realize you're making the assumption until after the action takes place. So here are some verbal cues. We feel that one of the fastest ways to identify your assumptions is to be able to verbally recognize them, to hear yourself saying them. So has anyone ever heard this? Uh, we're smarter than they are. I, I, when I did my research in this area, I came across this a lot. There was, oh, we're, we're you know, and, and I hear this in companies all the time. Now, there is a practicality to it. Every company, every leader wants to believe my people are the best. My people are the smartest. But I have to tell you, if there's any industry that's going to challenge that assumption, it is in cybersecurity. Because as soon as you start feeling that you are the smartest, that's when you're really in trouble because there's going to be somebody who is smarter than you are. Another one, um, oh, I, I can't believe they don't get it. Now, this is an issue with, uh, particularly with engineers, coders, uh, because they tend to see, well, not, not they, we all see the world through our eyes. We think that everybody thinks just like me, right? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a silly thing to say, right? If you were to say, I think the world thinks like, just like me, that's silly. But we do it. We see the world through our eyes. And because of that, we behave accordingly. So, for example, in engineering and coding, a lot of times engineers get very upset when somebody doesn't understand what they're saying. They get frustrated. Don't they get it? Don't they understand it? What's wrong with them? And then you have the reverse. You have the leaders. The leaders saying, you know, it's fascinating because I'll meet with I'll meet with a group of leaders and then I'll meet with their team. And the leaders are saying, they don't get it. Just they don't, they don't understand, you know? And then I meet with the team and they're saying, the leader, he doesn't get it. They doesn't understand. So everybody sees it through that, through their own eyes. And that's, that's, a, that's a giant assumption. And when you say that, it's telling you to stop for a second. Hey, you know what? I'm making an assumption. We call it an assumpt, the recognition of Making an assumption is called an assumption. My assumption is this. And that is a public announcement. It's also a kind of a personal announcement to yourself that you are now making an assumption. And it's very vital because it means that you can then talk to people in ways that you're not saying, the sky is blue. My assumption is the sky is blue. And they have an opportunity to think about it. You have an opportunity to think about it and challenge it. Now, we know this, uh, this gentleman, Panetta, when he was uh, the defensive uh, secretary of defense, um, and he... You know, actually here in New York, and he introduced the concept of, or you know, he told uh, uh, Cyber Pearl Harbor. And all of a sudden, everybody, oh, Cyber Pearl Harbor. Now, I'm not diminishing the message behind Cyber Pearl Harbor. What I'm saying is that people could relate to cybersecurity very quickly by understanding this kind of metaphor that's being made, because it's very easy to see through their eyes. Everyone understands Pearl Harbor, what happened, the, the, the difficulties, the damages, you know, a surprise attack, all of that they understand. They see it through their eyes. So I was a little concerned about that, because I thought, you know, in business, particularly in business, businesses latch on to those big ideas, those big metaphors that they think they can manage. But what happens is then they start to making an assumption, like, well, no one would ever do that. No one would ever do that. See, I think that's a big issue in, in um, cybersecurity because there's a feeling that something happens and it's disastrous, and then there's a part that says, well, okay, well, but they wouldn't do that. And that's exactly what ends up happening. So I was in uh, Brazil, and uh, in Brazil, and in Brazil, um, this is, uh, I was driving with a, uh, a client of mine, and uh, he was driving, and we pull into what I thought was a, uh, a parking lot, because there was a guy outside waving a flag. Uh, they're called uh, flanelinas, flanelinas, waving a flag, and they're usually fl flannel, uh, that's what gives them their names, and you pull into the lot, and you pay them money, and I said, oh, that's kind of interesting, and I looked around to see where the pay station was or whatever, and there was no pay station, and so um, I said to him, what? You gave money, do you get a ticket like for the car or something? He, he says, no, 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 no. You pay because they're ransoming. It's a ransom. 
If you don't pay them, then they key your car, they you know, take the key and they scratch the car, or they deflate the tires. Ransom. And I said, ransom? That's, that's insane. And then I thought about parking a car in New York and how much you have to pay, and I, no, maybe it's not that crazy, but, but the concept was pretty crazy. And then when I talked to, to Natalie, she told me the same thing happened in Italy, and, and she said, that's weird. See, the idea is we, we see the world through our eyes. We see the world through our culture. And so we tend to judge other cultures for, in a, in a, in a, in a way that, you know, this is, it's unethical, and they actually are trying to change it in Brazil, but it is a way of life in Brazil. And if we don't understand that way of life, and see it for what it is without assuming it's something you know, that we should add judgment to, then we're in trouble. Our car will be keyed. I could have pulled in a lot and said, I don't believe in that. I don't do that in the United States. I'm not paying you. And I would have come back, and my car would have been, the tires would have been flat. So that brings us in. We've had some discussion today about ransomware. This is uh, Scott Schaeferman, and, and he wrote, and I invite you to read some of his articles. He has three part, a three-part article that's done once a year and he talks about ransomware. And the point that, that he elicited was very strong because what it, it, what it showed was it really, he challenges you, and every year he challenges you to think a little differently and challenge your assumptions about they couldn't do that. They would never do that. And some of the stuff now is, is, is some common. He started this, I think, about two years ago, but he does it every, he's been doing it every year. So he talks about distractions, you know, distractions, a uh, fraternity... Um, it's some college fraternity basically set up some malware program that basically went into the security office and every weekend the security department ended up spending time trying to fix their computers. And the whole idea was the fraternities just didn't want them on campus. And, and it worked. It was very successful. It's a, kind of a humorous example, but, you know, very dangerous. And then you get into human life, you know, going into, and, uh, going into introducing uh, malware into... Uh, into a hospital system, and that not, you're not trying to steal any information. All you want to do to the hospital is say, pay us a certain fee, otherwise we will shut down the operations and what is being held hostage but human life. So, so these are just some examples of, of ransomware. But the point is that the concept of ransomware doesn't have, in the business world, I could say, doesn't have the same kind of impact as it does as a cyber Pearl Harbor. Because they think no one would do that. But the reality is, this ultimately could be as dangerous as any cyber Pearl Harbor. Any cyber Pearl Harbor. Now, because we're a very mixed group here, I want to present to you some examples of how this works in the real kind of world of business. So this is called the spin pop. And it's a beautiful idea. It's created, uh, the guy who owned the company is called John Osher. John Osher was, is a brilliant man, never graduated, I don't even want to graduate high school, but he's one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the United States. He's a um, Broadway investor, producer. I mean, it's just phenomenally successful. Anyway, he had a company, and it created this thing called the Spin Pop. Now, think of this concept, very simple. You take a lollipop, which costs anywhere from 25 to 99 cents, you put it into this little contraption, and you have a button, it spins around, and now you can charge $4.99. $4.99. Now, that was back in 1992 when he introduced it. It's now selling for, seven, I think, $7.99 in like Toys R Us or whatever. So, really good idea. He was so successful, he sold the company. He sold the company, and um, he could have retired. Uh, but he, he, he's not the kind of guy that retires. So he decided that he wanted to do something and create a new mass product. So he went to the supermarket with two other guys, and they ended up at the toothbrush section, and they saw it growing and all the colors and sizes and shapes. He said, this is a really interesting area, but if we're if we just like everybody else, then we're we're going to be like everybody else. We need to think differently. And so he said, what if we could create an electric toothbrush for under $5? For under $5. Now, let's go to the experts at the time. Braun, Oral, oral Care, uh, Sonic Care. Um, these were the experts. These are the people that produced electric toothbrushes and sold them from anywhere from $75 to $150. These were the experts that said, nobody knows it better than we do. And, you know, you can't do that. And so they made a number of assumptions. We are the experts. The cost to make this change is prohibitive. The, our people are the smartest in the business. 
If they're the smartest in the business and they can't do it, no one else can. The end user will never buy into it. The concept's not going to work. If it, could, if it could have been done, we would have done it, or someone would have done it already. They had all these ideas, all these assumptions that kept them out of the marketplace. So, what does John Osher do? Well, John Osher did a couple of things. First of all, he remembered one thing. You take this item, and you place it at about this high. This is the spin pop. You place it about this high in the store. Why do you place it this high in the store? Right, eye level for who? Kids. And a kid sees a red button, what is a kid going to do? He's going to press it, that's right. And when he presses it, what is he going to say to his parents? You got it. There you go. So he looked at this, he said, I have a battery, uh, I got torque, uh, I, you know, I just have to kind of add some waterproofing, add some power, add the extended battery. And so that's exactly what he did. And what he created was this. He partnered with Procter & Gamble the smartest packaged goods company in the world, and he created the Crest Spin Toothbrush. The Crest Spin Toothbrush. Now, I just wanted to show you. So he challenged all the assumptions, right? He looked at what he had, he challenged the assumptions of the expert, and he created something brand new that didn't exist before. But even Procter & Gamble, the smartest marketer, one of the smartest in the world, they said to him, you know, we're ready to roll this out, here's your TV campaign. And he said, what TV campaign? Why are you spending money on TV? They said, well, we know what we're doing. This is what we do. We spend money on television. This is how we promote. This is how we create. And, and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. We already have our advertising. And they said, what are you talking about? We don't have advertising. That's what, that's what we do. We partner with you because that's what we do. He said, no, no, we have our advertising. Look, this little button, it says, try me. And he knew that when an adult saw this little button that said, try me, what are they going to do? They're going to press it. And when they press it and they see this vibration for under $5, what are they going to do? They're going to buy it. This product was so successful that Procter & Gamble decided that they wanted to buy him out. He invested $1.5 million in the development of that product. In 18 months, Procter & Gamble bought him out. And they bought him out for $475 million. So, so I encourage you, that there is a significant power to identifying when you make an assumption, but be particularly careful when that assumption is used to pull you back into your comfort level. Hold on to that assumption, stay out there in that uncomfortable zone, and then start to play with that assumption. I'm going to give you just five easy, or four easy steps. When that point of making assumptions. So the first part is that you want to accept that you're making the assumption, no judgment. I think most of you here, by raising your hand, you already, you're already at that kind of awareness level. But believe it or not, I a lot of people in this world are not at that level. Now, once you, once you acknowledge that you make assumptions, then what you want to do is you want to surface that assumption. That's when you turn it into an assumption. And you want to look for those verbal cues. You want to look, you know, there's, we have a whole database of these, of these uh, cues, the verbal cues, and we're collecting them, and we're doing them by leadership and marketing and sales. We're starting now to collect them in cybersecurity. And then you have two decisions to make. First is, you can decide to invest in that assumption and leave it what I call unchecked. Just go with it. Or, you could do what John Osher did, and he decided to challenge it. He decided to check those industry assumptions, and then he decided not just to consider them, to reflect on them, which is okay, but he decided to reject them. And in rejecting them, he was able to create something new that hadn't existed before. And I believe in cybersecurity, that is really part of the onus that's on you all the time. Creating something that didn't exist before. And boy, that is really hard. Because as soon as you create it, you have to create the next thing, and then the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. So in conclusion, or before I get to my conclusion, I'd like to thank all of you for your time. It's been a long day. I see many of you taking notes and some photographs and so forth. So thank you very much, and I, I thank the, the Army Cyber Institute for inviting me. And what I'd like to do is, um, I do have a, I have to say, I'm like a proud parent. We have a new book that just came out. Challenge Your Assumptions, uh, uh, Change Your World. And um, I invite you, we have, we're actually doing a little bit of a special promotion. We're going to do it uh, in about two or three weeks, 
uh, a special price for the, for the book and so forth. So uh, here's my contact information up there, email, LinkedIn. If you're interested, uh, just let me know and I'll send you a link to, the, uh, uh, to, 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 to ordering at a, at a very, very, very special price. So let me do something in conclusion. Uh, I'm going to, I have a great uncle and he was a magician. So I want to uh, conclude by uh, ending with a, a little magic trick in, uh, that I think you might like. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this Coke bottle disappear. Watch. Pay very close attention. It happens really quickly. Ah. Look at that. Oh, you, I'll do it again for you. Okay, good. All right, make this Coke bottle. I'm going to make it disappear. Now, I know what all of you are doing right now. You're making an assumption. You're assuming that I am, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that I'm holding the Coke bottle. Excuse me. <coughs> ah. Mm. That's good. I needed that. So now you have to ask yourself, hmm, maybe he's not holding the Coke bottle. Maybe he's using a special bag. Maybe he's using a special bottle. Maybe he did an amazing form of misdirection. Maybe he hypnotized all of us at the same time. You see, in the world of cybersecurity, it's very important to be able to acknowledge that you're going to make the assumption then to be able to surface that assumption, then to decide what to do with it. In this case, you assumed I'm holding the Coke bottle, but now you all of a sudden have other choices, other methods, other way of achieving this illusion. So when you take your assumptions, acknowledge them, turn them into assumptions, and then challenge it, well, that's when the magic really happens. Thank you very much for your time, and best of luck in the cyber school. I know you said that you're a uh, newcomer to cybersecurity, but do you see any assumptions in the uh, oh, industry? Oh, oh yeah, well, oh, oh, I, I see a lot of a lot of assumptions. Uh, so I see assumptions in uh, I see in, in in well from all ends, from the Cody end to to the leadership end. Okay, um, uh, Greg, Greg was Greg uh, Conti was actually was the re reason I got here, and uh, Greg. Uh, actually, he, he enlightened me to an assumption about, if I can mention it, about coding, uh, that, that there's a, there's a it's, it's, it's very interesting, uh, particularly as, as an outsider, but to see it, that, you know, people write code, and, and if I'm a coder, and I'm really good, I believe in my code, and then I put it into a compiler, is that right? I put it through a compiler, the assumption is that what gets kicked out is still good code, and then it gets moved on. And often, when it goes to the compiler, there's a problem. There, there, there are issues. Um, there are, I think, cultural issues that I think that in the world of cybersecurity you have to address, which is, which is very much, you know, how do you think like the enemy? How do you think like the adversary? I mean, you, you, we think we understand that there may be, you know, we see the world in code and we think it's a universal, a universal application, but the reality is the, the, the cultural differences, for example, when you deal with it in China and in and, and, and business in China, and I've talked to bankers about this, the bankers, they often say they, they go and they talk to these bankers, or they talk to their clients, and the clients are very upfront about, oh, well, you know, we're doing shadow banking here, or we're doing this deal there. They're not hiding the fact that they might be doing something that's a little bit corrupt. You know, and they, they don't really, they, they don't hide it. And that's a very different cultural difference than here in, in the West in the West. So that affects how we're going to look at our cybersecurity. And we have to understand that viewpoint without assuming any kind of moral implications behind it. We have to see it for what it is, and then we have to deal with it. But our assumptions tend to, tend to, get, it, to get in our way. Um, is that... Okay. All right, thank you for asking that. Uh, what you're proposing really is that we stop thinking and that's going to be, that's going to render us useless for most of the day. Some, some would argue that I'm already there. But 
where, where do we draw the line? So what, what are some, some, some insights into how to identify high value assumptions that we should consider and ignore the other 99.9%? .9 so, so that's a really good question. And I deal with this all the time because it really can make you kind of obsessive about uh, questioning everything. So, so you know, we, we, uh, the shortcut is called heuristics. Uh, that really is a, the best description of the shortcut that we take. A heuristic space, the basic premise of heuristics is that we're going to make an assumption along the way. We're going to give up the verification of certain information in order to act. So, for example, you go to a restaurant, you, you, you assume that the chair is going to work. You don't feel the chair, right? You don't, you don't, you don't go into the kitchen, right, to, to look in how they're going to... You, you don't go to that... To that, to that extent. So, so you, there, is a, there is a line you have to draw. So there are a couple things. I think uh, one is emotional state. I think that when you have to make a key decision and you're at a high emotional state, I would err on the side that you're going to make some assumptions and those often are dangerous assumptions. So I use that. So if I'm, if I'm in a situation, and, and personal ones, I mean, it applies to my, my, my own life. If I'm, if I'm feeling really tense, and uh, I have a conversation with my son, and I'm about to say something based on an assumption, I stop myself, and I, and I question, because I know that my emotional state at that moment might be overshadowing. So, so in business, I think in emotional states, you have to be very, very, very careful. And then it's the weight of the, also the weight of the decision. So if the decision is you're talking about a multi-billion dollar decision, and you better spend the time uh, trying to uh, raise those awareness. So, for example, I spoke to a CEO uh, dealing in the area of compliance at a bank and dealing in compliance. And, you know, comp uh, compliance, there's a certain parallel between cybersecurity and compliance because there's all these rules that are being made. At, made at every, every hour, they're remaking the rules and so forth. And she said something very interesting. She said when she's at a, a meeting with her senior people and she feels she needs to support her senior people, if they present an idea to her, and her assumption is, it's a bad idea. It's not going to work. It's not worth the time. It's too expensive. She will say to that person, this is my assumption. This is how I see it. But you know what? Let's, let's try it out. Let's see where it goes. So that's another way that she, she weigh, weighs it. So there isn't, I, I wish there was an ABC that we could follow, but, but there really isn't. But the emotional state, the weight, of the, the weight of the decision in terms of the outcome, what the outcome is going to be, uh, to, uh, does it? But on the same side, I have to say that there are certain outcomes, there are certain assumptions that are made within business that are very minor that end up costing a business huge money. That's why I was kind of talking about ransomware. Ransomware could be somebody who is being blackmailed in an organization, and they're spending millions of dollars on cybersecurity trying to protect the system, and this one person goes in and is being blackmailed. Somebody found information. It had nothing to do with encryption. They just found information on this person they don't want to reveal. So they blackmail this person. This person ends up going in and stealing secrets. So, okay, thank you for that question. <laughs>